Hello YouTube, this is Eric from Coder Snacks. Today we'll talk about a question that introduces us to graphs and shortest pathfinding. Let's get started. Shortest pathfinding has many uses, from mapping and GPS navigation, to internet routing, to video games, those creepers have to find their way to you somehow, and many others. There are many ways to implement pathfinding, and we'll only talk about a couple today, but this is a great example of a graph algorithm. Let's start by describing what a graph is. I think of a graph as a group of things that have connections between them. In graph language, the things are called vertices, and the connections are called edges. Anytime you have pairs of things that are connected somehow, graphs should come to mind. Here are some examples of things and connections you might use a graph for. Places that are connected by roads, computers that are connected by network links, people that are connected by ancestry, people who are connected by friendships, like Facebook, web pages that are connected by links, install objects that are connected by dependencies. These connections can go both ways or only one way. For example, if you have two computers A and B connected together, A is connected to B, but B is also connected to A. If the connection always goes both ways, we call the graph undirected. On the other hand, if I follow the president on Twitter, that doesn't mean the president will follow me. These kinds of graphs are said to be directed. Also, sometimes these edges have costs, or weights, attached to them. If we're implementing a GPS, for example, we'll want to know the distance or travel time between places. Those would be the weights on the edges of our graph. Now that we know we'll use a graph for this problem, there are some questions we can ask. How big do we expect our input size to be? If the input size is large, certain kinds of solutions or graph representations could be infeasible. Is the graph all the information we have about the problem? Some shortest path algorithms can use other information to generate guesses about our path that can improve our chances of finding an answer quickly. Is the graph undirected? That is, if we have an A to C edge, does that also imply we have a C to A edge? Also, are we guaranteed that there's a path from start to end? If not, we should do some error checking of some sort. There are other questions we could ask, but this should be enough to get us started. For our problem, let's assume for now that we have no auxiliary information. We'll say the graph is undirected, and we don't know anything about the size of the graph, but we should think about memory efficiency. First, we need to decide how we're going to represent our graph. Let's look at a visual representation of the graph in our example. There are two main ways to represent a graph programmatically, each with advantages and disadvantages. The first is called an adjacency matrix. In an adjacency matrix, we make a list of lists, or 2D array, representing the costs from every vertex to every other vertex. We can then look up the cost from any vertex to any other vertex with a matrix lookup. For example, if we wanted to get the cost from A to C, we can see that it's 3. On the positive side, it's quick to check if an edge is in the graph by looking at the location of that edge in our matrix. On the negative side, some algorithms want to know all of the edges that some vertex connects to. In order to do that, we have to look at every entry in a row, many of which could be non-edges. Additionally, this takes up O of V squared space, where V is the number of vertices. This is fine for small examples, but if I want a graph of a billion web pages and their links, this is not the representation we're looking for. In general, the matrix representation is considered better if your matrix is dense, meaning that most of the edges exist, or when you need to know about specific edges. The other main way to represent a graph is called an adjacency list. Here, each vertex has a list of edges that connect it to other vertices. This is more efficient space-wise, since you only need space proportional to the number of vertices and edges. However, finding out whether a specific edge exists requires iterating through the whole list for that edge. If you only care about a vertex's neighbors, though, this weakness doesn't hurt. This representation is considered better if the graph is sparse, meaning each vertex only has a few edges. There are ways to mix and match these with other hash table solutions, but these two are the typical useful representations. Let's begin by writing the code to create the graph. In an interview setting, you should consider whether or not to use a more object-oriented style, as a graph makes a natural object, but OO style can take more code to write. Since our graph is sparse, we will use an adjacency list. 
We have a dictionary where the key is the name of the vertex and the value is a list of tuples of edge and cost for each edge. Then we'll add a few short checks to make sure things are reasonable and we can move on to the meat of the problem, finding the shortest path in this graph. Next, let's talk algorithms. Often, when we're looking for a solution on a graph, we'd use Breadth First Search, BFS, or Depth First Search, DFS. The high-level explanation of BFS is that we look at all the paths that are one edge long, then all the paths that are two edges long, and so on, until we find a path. DFS goes down one path, continuing to explore down that one path, taking backtracks as necessary if there are dead ends, until we find a path. However, we're not going to dig into these algorithms here because they don't quite fit. If we find a path this way, we have no confidence that it's the shortest. For example, in this graph, BFS would find this solution with a cost of 100 on one edge, instead of this better solution that costs 40 over four edges. We will cover these algorithms more in future videos, but for now, let's set them aside. When I hear find the shortest path, I think of Dijkstra's algorithm and A-star search. Let's take a look. Dijkstra is D-I-J-K-S-T-R-A. This is not a typo. He was a Dutch computer scientist who happens to have three index variables in a row in his name. Pretty sweet. Dijkstra's algorithm finds the best cost from a start vertex to every other vertex. We start by saying the best cost to our start vertex is zero, and the cost to every other vertex is unknown or infinity. Now we ask, what is the lowest cost thing we can get to from somewhere we know the best cost of? It looks like C. We go there and mark the cost to that vertex, which we know is the best. Intuitively, if some other cost were better than this, we would have gone that way first instead of this way. For example, if there were some additional vertices that allowed a cheaper path, like this path through H with cost 1 plus 1 or 2, we would have explored those vertices first instead of C, because they have a lower cost. So, we know this distance for C is optimal. If you'd like a more formal proof, I'll put a link in the description. Next, we again look at the costs from things we know the best cost for and pick the minimum from somewhere we have the answer for to somewhere we don't have solved yet. In this case, we have both A to B for 5 and C to D for 5, 3 plus 2. We have to remember to include the cost of how to get to each vertex we know, we can't just take the edge cost. We can do this in either order, for our example I'll just mark both. We repeat this process until we know the cost to the vertex we care about. One note, this only works if there are no negative costs, or more accurately negative cycles, in our graph. Why is that? If there is a negative cycle, we can violate the understanding that holds this algorithm together, that once we have an answer for a vertex, we know it's the best, because we always go to the cheapest vertices first. But, if there's a negative cycle, we could go somewhere we already have the best cost for more cheaply. Here, for example, A changes cost from 0 to negative 4, but 0 is supposed to already be the optimal cost, so don't use this if there are negative costs. One more detail. This algorithm as is only tells us the cost of the shortest path. If we want the shortest path itself, we need to keep track of some more data. If we store for each vertex what the previous vertex was, we can reconstruct the path that we take to get the best cost by backtracking. We start at the end, see what vertex led here, go to that node, and repeat. Let's start with the code to calculate the shortest cost. We turn the edges into a graph and initialize a dictionary of best costs, which will store the best cost to each vertex. Next, while we don't have the cost we're looking for, we're going to find the next cheapest vertex to add to best costs by looking at all the vertices we have so far and all the edges leading from those vertices. For each edge, if we don't have the best cost for the vertex that edge points to, we check the cost of getting to the new vertex through our current vertex, which we do know the cost of already. Then, we keep the minimum of all of these. If at some point we find that we didn't get a new cheapest vertex to add to best costs, then we know that we've found the cost of every vertex our start is connected to, so we have to declare failure. 
Here, we return minus 1, because the costs should all be positive, but you could also raise an error, or whatever you like. Finally, we set the best cost of the minimum cost vertex we found, and repeat until we find a best cost for our end node, which we return. When we test this with our example graph, and a graph that isn't connected, we get the answers we were expecting. So far, so good. However, we're doing a lot of duplicate work here. There are a lot of edges we're examining multiple times from vertices that happened not to be the best in some given iteration. We'd like to examine edges only once. Can we do this? Let's try using a priority queue. A priority queue is a data structure that lets us remove the minimum element quickly, and since we're repeatedly looking for the vertex with minimum cost, this is exactly what we want. We'll start by putting our start node in the queue. Then, repeatedly, we will remove the minimum cost vertex from the queue, check if we already have the best cost for that vertex, and if not, set that cost and add all the neighbors of that vertex to the queue. We repeat this until we have the cost for the final vertex. Continuing this example, we look in our queue and see that the minimum cost is 5, and vertex D has it. We add that best cost and add all the neighbors to the queue. We do the same for B next. Then, our next item in the queue is the cost of 6 for A, but we already have a best cost for A, so we discard it. And so on. Let's look at code that does this. We make the graph and initialize our queue and best cost dictionary. We then add our start vertex to the queue and start our loop. While we still have items in the queue, and we don't have a best cost for our end vertex, we get the lowest cost vertex from the queue and check if we have a best cost for it already. If not, we mark this new best cost we found and add all of the neighboring edges to our queue. Finally, at the end, we return the best cost if we have it, or minus one if we didn't find a cost for that node. This is better, because at worst we only have to do work for each edge in the graph once as we visit the vertices. What's the runtime complexity of this? We have to visit each vertex in O of V time, and we have to add O of E vertices to the queue. Because the priority queue is backed by a heap, which is what allows us to get the minimum quickly, adding an element to the priority queue is O of log n, where n is the number of elements in the priority queue. Our complexity ends up being O of V plus E log E. One small improvement we can make here, we're adding some vertices to the queue when we already know the best cost for these vertices. Here, for example, we're adding C to the queue when we know the best cost is 3. We don't need to do that, and this will slightly improve our code. This particular implementation is still space inefficient. We said that we add O of E vertices to the queue, but in a complete graph, E can be O of V squared, since every vertex can point to every other vertex. We should only need O of V vertices in the queue, since what we're really popping off the queue is the next cheapest vertex to get to. Unfortunately, to achieve O of V space, we need a priority queue implementation that lets you update the priority of an element already in the queue. Python doesn't have one in the standard library that I'm aware of, but I'll put a link in the description of one implementation of such a priority queue. Finally, we would like to actually reconstruct the path to our goal. Earlier, we talked about adding another data structure to store where the best paths pass through. Let's add a dictionary that tells us, for each optimal node, where that edge came from. To make this work, we need our queue elements to also have this information. Then, to reconstruct the path, we can start at the end and walk backwards through our graph via the backtrack edges to get our path, reversing it at the end so it's in the right order. The code now looks like this. Do we still have wasted work? This algorithm doesn't only calculate the best cost from a start to an end vertex, it calculates the cost from a start to all end vertices. Can we do better than that? In the worst case, it turns out that we can't. You could imagine a path that has to go through every vertex. The best we can do is abort early if we happen to get the cost for our goal vertex. Dijkstra's algorithm turns out to be good here, but there are other algorithms you can research if you're curious. A star is a shortest path algorithm that can help you if you have a guess, or heuristic, about the distance from your goal to any particular node. 
For example, on a map, you could use the straight line distance to your goal as a guess. Next, there are other shortest path algorithms you could check out that are better in other circumstances. One way to cut down on some of the runtime complexity of Dijkstra's algorithm is to do a bidirectional search. In other words, search from both the start and the end at the same time, and when your searches meet, you have a shortest path. This version is a little subtle, but can greatly reduce runtime. There are many other possibilities and research on this, as finding the shortest path on a graph is quite useful. Again, think how often we use GPSs. I'll put some more links in the description. Next time, we'll do some work in design and binary. Old games used to require you to enter some kind of a password to continue, since there was no storage for save files. Let's come up with a system to create a password from a game state, as described here. I hope you learned something from this video. If you have any questions, comments, things I've missed, or problems you want answered or covered, let me know in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, it would be great if you liked the video, subscribed, or both. I really appreciate it. See you next time here on Coder Snacks.